my colleague who's part of this team is Dr. Jennifer Lebovich, and she is an assistant professor in psychology at Harvard Medical School and is a clinical psychologist who does patient consults in our facets and atopic dermatitis programs. So I first met Jenny during her fellowship, which was a little over 10 years ago, uh, when she was rotating through the atopic dermatitis center. And we convinced her to help us on, to analyze a food allergy survey, survey, which we had already done, but we didn't know what to do with. And, um, and, then, and so then when she finished her fellowship, I was like, oh, I've really got to bring her on. She's be so great for our food allergy patients and for our research. Uh, and really, it was actually through a various generous family that uh, gave uh, us a research grant so that we could study a coping skills group model. And, um, so this philanthropy was really important and really helpful in me being able to bring on this very talented young faculty member who subsequently has been really done great work in the field of um, looking at the psychological aspects of food allergy and of participating in oral immune therapy trials and also being a great uh, help to our patients. So it's uh, again, my privilege to introduce my colleagues here at, on the panel. I'll start with uh, Dr. Nancy Rotter. So uh, one of my greatest frustrations being part of the Food Allergy Center at Mount Sinai in New York was that we didn't really have an effective means to address what is such a common comorbidity of food allergy, uh, which is anxiety. Um, it's a, basically a sign that your kid is kind of with it and smart, that they get pretty anxious about the idea that something they eat might make them really sick, right? So um, nevertheless, I think a lot of our centers um, have struggled with how to meet this very important need. So um, enter Nancy Rotter, who has a passion for uh, this area, who it really has a specialized focus on uh, anxiety in, uh, in several contexts, one of which is food allergy, um, and uh, basically um, is uh, such a great colleague in working with families to essentially arm them with additional coping skills um, and techniques for um, uh, you know, dealing with that aspect uh, for many of them. Um, and so Nancy's been an integral part of the team. She co-attends one of our uh, multidisciplinary clinics uh, in Boston, the Food Allergy Center, every week, and it's a real privilege. Lisa, uh, so I uh, can't, you know, I feel like I should be talking to, so it should be like at a wedding or something. So, <laughs> so uh, here's what I'll say about Lisa Steve. When I was coming to Boston, um, uh, a colleague of mine in the city, an allergist uh, over at the Brigham, who also does a clinic with us named Joshua Boyce. Josh uh, is a highly respected allergist across the country, um, has an endowed chair over at the Brigham, was the lead author, in fact, of the NIH um, consensus guidelines on food allergy. Josh said to me, if you don't hire Lisa, you're an idiot. <laughs> and because basically Lisa's kind of the heart and soul of our clinic, she has the most kind of you know, uh, broad experience, uh, personal, professional as a school nurse, as a, as a nurse in our practice. Um, uh, again, incredible privilege to work with Lisa, so. Thanks. Um, I, I do want to say before I ask the questions, once again, to pray, you know, I guess my continuous, con continuation of the praise of these two hospitals, uh, a lot of allergy centers around the country um, do not have any means of helping patients with quality of life. And they cer certainly don't have the quality of individuals that we have here. So it, it's, it's really unique. A lot of times it's here's an EpiPen, go, deal, learn. I just can't say enough about the great work, um, again, that MGH and Children's do in this respect. Um, I'm, I want to start with kind of younger kids and work our way up. So, Dr. Lebovich, I'll start with you and ask, I, I guess, you know, kids obviously are all different. When, is there an age where it's appropriate for kids to be carrying their EpiPen and even where you'd feel comfortable that they could self-administer? Uh, so this is a good question. I think it is very variable and depends on the child. And I think when we talk about it, and I think when we talk about the age at which a child would carry their EpiPen, we're thinking about some different things. We might be thinking in a school setting, and depending on the nature of the school and how far they're traveling, that may be carrying the, pen, the EpiPen from area to area with the idea that an adult would be responsible for it at any given location when it got there. Um, but, and then we're also thinking about at what age they would be able to self-administer. Um, and there are no hard and fast rules. 
Um, I think certainly with, with younger children, um, as they move towards the later elementary to middle school years, starting to carry is a great idea because it's building responsibility and that skill of always having the EpiPen with them, whether or not they would administer at that, at that age. Um, and I think it's really important, even before kids would be responsible for self-administration, to be practicing with EpiPen trainers so they're just feeling more confident when it comes to um, comes to the EpiPen. And we can think about this with young kids the same way they practice with a toy stethoscope before they went to the pediatrician's office. They're building confidence. But certainly as kids get older, when they're spending time out on their own, for example, some pre-adolescents, teenagers, they have to be carrying that EpiPen when there aren't going to be um, adults <coughs> present monitoring them. So we want to make sure that in those situations, whether or not the indiv individual child would feel comfortable self-administering, that they would know what to do in an emergency. So how to get help, and similarly, it's that friends would need to know the location of where they keep their EpiPen. So it's a gradual process, practicing for comfort to actually practicing for skill. And I know some of the allergists vary on whether they want their kid, their uh, patients practicing with expired EpiPens on an orange or things like that, but building comfort in, the, in those ways too. Uh, Dr. Rotter, um, whether the child is young or, or older into the teenage years or even an adult, that, that first anaphylactic reaction, in a lot of cases, Dr. Scherfler mentioned, can be very traumatizing and can cause a lot of anxiety. How do parents help a child going through that? Well, one of the things that I have found that is really important is, as a first step is for parents themselves to be able to talk to their partner, spouse, family members, other adults about the experience because it's often very difficult, traumatic for them. And to be able to do that before they talk more directly with the child about what happened and the meaning of that I think is really important um, so that they're in a place that they feel confident and sure about what they want to share with the child because it can be very difficult, obviously, from so many different perspectives. And, you, and I think parents want to be just cautious about honest but cautious about what they share with their children. Um, I think it's helpful sort of once they're at that place and hopefully fairly quickly that they can talk with their child about what happened and, and, and approach it in a couple of ways. One is allowing the child to tell them what their experience was and acknowledging their feelings. I think it's really important for parents to be open to whatever those feelings are, whether it was fear, which is a common one, um, anger, maybe even at the parent for giving them the EpiPen. I think that um, being able to acknowledge those feelings is really important. Um, but then I think the next step is that parents um, be able to talk with children about sort of what happened and how that was meaningful in terms of their own protection and going forward. Um, one example might be if a child happened to um, eat something at a birthday party that they thought was safe, like pizza, but had eaten pizza many, many times before without a reaction. I think it's important to put it in the context that um, this was a time where we were, that, that there was a, um, an accident or a mistake, but that you've done this so many other times before and been safe. And then sort of what are the teachable moments about that? And I think teachable moments have to do with things like um, actually experiencing the EpiPen. So many of the children that I see are so anxious, and, and I help Lisa with food challenges often, and the biggest, um, with children's anxiety, the biggest fear is often, what if I need an EpiPen? And I have found, and, and you guys can speak to this as well, that often when children have actually experienced um, having had an EpiPen and found how much they felt better, that it was much less scary. And so I think that's a teachable moment. Yes, it hurt, and yes, you didn't want that, um, but in fact, it did help you to feel better. And so I think that's another teachable moment. Um, and I think just having the big context of this, this, you know, this is rare, this, ha this doesn't happen very much, but when it does happen, you know, you know, you know what to do. Another piece is um, talking about the, talking to the child about being brave, and also about their participation in. You did such a good job in telling me that you were having trouble breathing, or that you were having a bad stomach ache, and so uh, you did your job so that I could help you. So I think using it as a teachable moment can be very helpful. Thanks, um, Nurse Steve and, and Dr. Lobovich, please jump in as well. Um, Dr. Lobovich uh, talked about as the kids the kids grow up and. and when it's appropriate for them to be self-carrying and, and hopefully prepared to self-administer epinephrine. But in general, teenagers, you know, those of us that have teenagers would say sometimes they don't always 
think clearly is a nice way of putting it. You know, a, a lot of times they don't want to carry their epinephrine. They don't want other kids to know that they have food allergies. They don't want to be different. They don't want to not go to Applebee's and risk a reaction. Oops. So, um, <laughs> how do we, <laughs> that did not come out of my mouth. <laughs> how do we help children, or how do we help teenagers, not even help teenagers, um, how do we encourage teen teenagers to, to do the right thing, to learn proper behaviors and to follow through with their plan? Well, I think it starts much younger than teenage years, and so you have to train your child early to be carrying that uh, EpiPen and, and be very consistent about it so that it goes to, to sports, to school, you know, wherever they go, that needs to follow them. And that needs to start much earlier than teenage years. And then for those kids that are sort of uh, balking at carrying it, I always tell parents that it's, everything should be conditional on you carrying it. So you get to go to that ski trip with your high school class if you bring your EpiPen with you. And you know, really reinforcing that message all the time. Um, kids who've had reactions without their EpiPens are really frightened, and uh, that can be a game changer for them, and they, they'll carry it. Are there, are there well, I guess for everyone, are there strategies that you would tell to, we, we felt it was very important, my wife and I, when, when our, our children uh, grew up, that they have friends that are understanding that, you know, will be their advocates, God forbid, there's a reaction and, and they're not prepared to. Is there a way to help teenagers who don't want to do that? How do you, how do you help them, encourage them to, share their food allergies with their friends or with their new teachers in a new school or with their dorm mates when they go off to college? One thing I like to do when I'm doing food challenges with teenagers, I, I always sort of tease them that I do food allergy boot camp besides doing the challenge. And we're gonna review all those things about carrying their EpiPen, what they need to do with, with uh, intimate kissing, uh, with alcohol, because that's gonna change how you react and your judgment. And um, I review all these things with them uh, during my little boot camp. Uh, and sometimes I'll have parents leave the room so that I can talk to them you know, about things they don't want to talk about in front of their parents. Uh, and I just think addressing these things over and over is the most important approach. I was going to say also in terms of talking to their friends, that's something that comes up a lot in some, sometimes in the teenage years is that we do see some more risk taking and sometimes the um, social rewards are sort of weighed higher than risk in, in teenage years. And so it's not that these kids don't necessarily know what to do to manage um, in an emergency situation or to stay safe, but they really want to fit in and they don't want to stand out. And here again and again, I just don't want my allergy to be a big deal. But the nice thing is we also hear my friends who know about my food allergy though, they get it, they know what to do. It's not a big deal, we can go out. And so I do work a lot with teenagers um, and, and younger than that, pre-adolescents, young kids too, how simple language to explain a food allergy to their friends. You know, uh, we're going out and just, you know, I, I have allergies, so I, you know what, I'm gonna have to do things like ask about ingredients, bring my EpiPen. It's not a big deal, but it's really important. And the more they can start that process early, the education, the more kids, their friends are their biggest advocates. Um, and it's also making sure their friends know, as I said before, um, if they're out with friends, where do they keep their EpiPen? What to do in an emergency? So we, we started with the little kids and we kind of moved up. So the last question I have is now the kids are ready to go to college. What should they look when they're evaluating colleges? Are there things they should be looking at in terms of uh, accommodations? Are there things you would suggest that they keep an eye out for? Or are there red flags that you would suggest? And this is for any one of you. They suggest that you know when you're looking at a college, if you see this, be a little cautious because we know that while college is primarily for education, at the same time you know, we need our kids to stay alive first and foremost. So. What would you suggest they look for or look out for? I think in the interest of full disclosure, I, most people who know me know that I have two boys with food allergies who are now 25 and 20. And so we've been through this process with schools. And probably the best thing that's happened in college food allergy or university food allergy is that Lesley University was sued by um, five students and the Department of Justice um, found Lesley in violation. Uh, the students were mandated to be on the meal plan, but they couldn't eat the food. Uh, they were kids with celiac and food allergies. And it was a complete game changer in the uh, college food allergy. So I had one child who went to college before this uh, judgment and one who went after. And literally, when, for the one who went after, every tour we went on, food allergies came up naturally in the tour uh, conversation, not by us. So you'd go to the cafeteria and they'd say, um, if you have food allergies, this is what you need to do. And it is really completely different. 
Um, but it's still very tricky because of um, things like the HIPAA laws. So um, a family might give information to health services that this child has food allergies. And of course, the kids are 18 or older by the time they're going to college, so they're, you know, the, they are um, legal adults. So they might give their information to, to uh, health services, but health services cannot provide that to dining services. They cannot communicate it. And dining cannot communicate it to campus safety, and campus safety can't communicate it to res residential life. And so you have this mismatch of information. So the best way to approach it is through the Office of Disabilities for Colleges. And then they can coordinate all the care they, um, and all the information sharing. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of work, honestly. We started in April um, before my son went to college, and it, we really didn't have everything down until probably October, even though he had started school in August. It, it was a long process, a lot of meetings, um, but it's worked out fine. Uh, but it, it, it is, it's a really tough process. And then there's still kind of loopholes. So a lot, a lot of times the colleges will have an event catered. Like even freshman orientation was catered by an outside company. Uh, the, it was served by, food, uh, by uh, employees wearing the college clothing, but they did not actually prepare the food and they had no information about it. And then things like, uh, you know, a pizza party. That all comes in from the outside. So you have to train your kids on what the red flags are for them. But most colleges are very aware of it now. Uh, and the Food Allergy Research and Education has a pilot study going on right now of 12 different schools that are all different, uh, public, private, small, huge, uh, where they're trying to you know, figure out where these loopholes are and what the best process is. But for now, the Office of Disability Services, um, which I didn't initially want to do, and the school asked us to go that way. And that's what we recommend for um, our patients, too. And one, one last question, Dr. Ryder. This might be a little unfair, I hope it's not. It's not unfair, but it might be a challenging one. There's, there's always a lot of debate about uh, nut-free schools or not nut-free schools, um, allergy tables or not allergy tables. If a school district came to you and said, um, how, do we make, how do we keep the kids safe yet make them feel the most included? Do you have a recommendation? Um, well, and I will <laughs> defer to these questions. And I know, I know there are different opinions yeah, on this. Yeah, well, I, you know, and I think we've talked about this before. The idea that there's actually a table for people who are bringing foods that are common allergens in the cafeteria is, is tends to be mm -hmm. our preference. And so that it's the child who has, you know, who has allergies can sit amongst the other children where folks bringing nuts, peanuts, um, you know, sometimes dairy and eggs sit. Um, at a separate table. I don't know that that is something that has caught on a lot. I have a, a, a colleague whose child does go to a school where that's how they run it in one of the suburbs. Um, but to me, that's an important way to um, work on inclusion, that it's not the peanut you know, free table, it's the allergen table where the child sits amongst the other kids. Mm -hmm. And you guys wanna jump in? Well, I, oh, I was just gonna say that I think too, one of the things in terms of the child's comfort is whatever the, the policies the school has, making sure that they're following them and they're consistent. Because often it's less about nut-free, not nut-free, but what are they doing to think about avoidance, careful cleaning, and are they consistent? Because in terms of social inclusion and also anxiety, I see a lot of kids where a big source of anxiety is, my school says they are doing this, but they are not doing this, and then the kids feel left out there. So whatever the policy is, that they're following it. Right? So, so should schools go to um, non-food treats and rewards on special days, or is that asking too much? Is that taking it too far and the food allergy community trying to impose too much? Well, I, I worked as a school nurse for a number of years, and in our school, we um, did go to non-food treats. and. It was actually one of the first grade teachers who said, I'm not a party planner, I'm a teacher, and I'm really tired of all these food events. And it was really great because it actually took it off the table for the food, it wasn't, uh, the food allergy kids were not responsible for this change. And we also had several diabetic patients, and so it worked out well for them as well. And, and I do think there are other reasons why people might not be able to eat treats at school. You know, there might be religious reasons, there might be other medical issues. I, I do think none. Um, non-food treats are a good idea, and I think there are lots of different ways to do that that can be creative. I think the hard part is convincing people because that's how it's been for so long to, to make that shift. There was, um, I did a talk many years ago 
um, for an allergy group, and one of the women, one of the mothers, talked about how she got a t-shirt for every child in the class, and when it was their birthday, all the kids would decorate that t-shirt um, for that child, and I thought, you know, that is such a special and great thing, and um, you know, something that I think was really effective. And I would just add that the interesting thing in thinking about my own experience with my children's school and families that I've talked to is it's often, it's not the kids who have a problem with it. It's changed <laughs> for the parents. And so the kids really, they love whatever special activity they're plan is planned for um, an event or a party or a holiday. And so often there might be a couple years of transition for parents to get used to it, and then they love it because they're not always having to send cupcakes or something. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, uh, thank you. Uh, 